The WWF. Is it a champion for wild animals or a vehicle for elitist control and globalisation? I'm Alan Buttle. When I found out about the involvement of some very familiar names in the World Wide Fund for Nature, or World Wildlife Fund as it is still known in the US and Canada, I thought it would be a good subject for an investigation. I chose the WWF as a charity to investigate because it is one which most people will not have given a sceptical thought towards. The general public often just assume that the household name charities that have been around for generations are doing good work and I wanted in presenting this video to show that we cannot afford to assume anything. I just want to make it clear at the start that I'm getting no money for doing this, nor do I want any. I'm doing it for the purposes of hopefully giving people a better understanding of the world we live in. The WWF is an iconic charity which seems to be trusted by the majority of people worldwide. But is that trust warranted? The first three years of the organisation, which was founded in 1961, raised $2 million for projects, which was at the time considered a very large amount of money. Fifty-five years later, the WWF raised approximately 700 million euros every year. Currency devaluation aside, it is a charity which is obviously still very active today and one which still generates huge amounts of money, allowing them to spend big on campaigns, projects, staff, fancy offices and slick promotional videos. Now let's watch the latest promotional video from the WWF to see what they are saying about themselves. I am protecting life on our planet. Day by day, with every single thing I do. I conserve the world's biggest forests. I safeguard the rivers. And oceans. I stand up for coral reefs, rainforests, tundras, deserts, and grasslands. I work with communities in the Amazon, the Arctic. Congo and the Himalayas. I collaborate with the biggest companies on Earth to make their processes and their products more sustainable. I influence governments to create policy that recognizes and respects the importance of nature. I give a voice to all animals who call Earth their home. I'm protecting life on our planet. But because I'm with WWF, I am not doing it alone. 6,000 staff, 6 million members, in over 100 countries, for more than half a century. Businesses, foundations, governments, communities, individuals, and one iconic panda. Together, we are protecting life on our planet, including our own. Together, anything is possible. Please accept my apologies for putting you through that. Now, as you would expect from a major organisation, there's lots of information that can be found on the people who incepted the idea for the WWF and put it into reality and this should give us a clue as to what the real goals were and what the charity was set up to achieve. 
This documentary compiles pieces of evidence together in an attempt to create a picture and raise people's interest in investigating organisations like these for themselves. This documentary is not designed to be the proof of anything in particular. Now, let's start from the start. A man called Victor Stollen has been described as having the germ of the idea that led to the creation of the WWF. He had responded to Julian Huxley's articles in The Observer, stating that an international appeal aimed to raise millions of pounds should be set up on behalf of all wild species threatened by extinction. Huxley responded by putting him in contact with Max Nicholson, who saw the logic of his argument and encouraged Victor to write a memorandum about setting up such a fund. Nicholson already knew Huxley well. He was the first treasurer and later chairman of the British Trust for Ornithology and had worked with Julian Huxley to create the International Union for the Protection of Nature, which later became the International Union for Conservation of Nature. This memorandum has been described as brilliant, lengthy and eccentric. It argued that help should be sought from the Pope and the Archbishop of Canterbury. Nobody is in too high a place to lend a hand to defend creation, Victor said. He also argued that new tycoons be asked for money to create a shining monument in history. Nicholson checked the plausibility of setting up such a fund by showing the memorandum to Guy Mountfort, at head of a major advertising agency. This was, as Nicholson later acknowledged, a turning point. As a result, in May 1961, a meeting was held that included Peter Scott, the WWF's first chairman, as well as the three initiators. In the spring and summer of 1961, there were more meetings, but Victor Stollen came to be excluded from them. In a letter to Huxley, Nicholson wrote, Mr. Stollen is rather too much the naive enthusiast and rather too little the practical man of affairs to be very much help. The founding of the charity went on without him, and Victor Stollen is reported to have died within a few years of the founding of the WWF. Maybe Julian Huxley, who was from a family of prominent evolutionists, would not work with creationist Victor Stollen. Whatever the case, it was at the IUCN building in Morges, Switzerland, where the WWF opened its first office on September the 11th, 1961, with Prince Bernard becoming the organisation's first international president. The tycoons which were to be asked for money would seem to be Godfrey A. Rockefeller, Prince Bernard of the Netherlands and Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, though it seemed they were more keen on organising fundraising than putting in their own money. On the WWF website it says that Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, in 1961 became president of the British Appeal, the first national organisation in the World Wildlife Fund family, closely followed by the WWF US Appeal, which became the second national organisation. While not much mention is made of Godfrey A. Rockefeller's involvement in the creation of the WWF, on their memoriam for him, it says that he played an important role in the founding and creation of the WWF, including hiring the first staff and first chief scientist, Dr. Thomas Lovejoy. So, from what we can see, we have two royal princes, Bernard of the Netherlands and Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, and Godfrey A. Rockefeller a member of the Rockefeller oil and banking family, to this day the richest family in the United States, as integral founding members of this charity. What do you think prompted them to get involved? OK, now we're going to look at what the Queen and Prince Philip were doing to animals in Nepal in 1961. And after looking at this footage, I think you'd have to question whether a compassion for animals was ever part of Prince Philip's motivation for starting the WWF. Now a tiger shoot had been organized by King Mahendra for his guests. Quite an army of 327 elephants had been mobilized for the purpose, and to shoot, not tiger, but film, Pathé cameraman Cedric Baines took to the howdah. Cordoned by a sort of wall of white canvas was the area into which a tiger had been driven by beaters. Tigers have never seen canvas before, and so make no attempt to break out of the compound. Towards the set, as it's called, the Queen and her party were taken on saddled elephants before the serious business of the hunt began. Then, when all was ready, they transferred to howdahs. This is a land whose people have always lived under the menace of marauding tigers. The technique of hunting them to keep their numbers within as safe bounds as possible was perfected long ago.
keen eyes peered at the undergrowth. And yes, there was the tiger. As the Duke had a Whitlow on his trigger finger, the tiger was not royally slain. Nor was it even shot by the Foreign Secretary, who had an off day. However, Rear Admiral Bonham Carter and Sir Michael Adeen, between them, put an end to the beast. The tigress measured eight foot eight. King Mahendra had fulfilled a time-honored obligation of a host in Nepal and provided the royal party with a tiger to shoot. But there was more hunting to come. The next prey was a rhino. The queen spotted the huge beast, though it was almost completely hidden. The gun saw it too, and that was the end of another animal. We have to question whether a compassion for animals was ever part of his motivation. Prince Bernard of the Netherlands was also a keen big game hunting enthusiast. So maybe Prince Bernard and Prince Philip weren't exactly overwhelmed by their empathy for wild animals. But what about all the others who co-founded the WWF alongside them? Well, let's have a look at them. Now, Julian Huxley was a very influential person of his day. He was the first director of UNESCO. He was the first president of the British Humanist Association. He was a secretary of the Zoological Society of London and was an active and prominent member of the British Eugenics Society, of which he was vice president from 37 to 44 and president from 59 to 62. He also gave two of their celebrated annual Galton lectures in 1936 and 1962 called The Impending Crisis and Eugenics in Evolutionary Perspective, respectively. The first of which he opened his lecture by enthusiastically honouring fellow extreme eugenicist Margaret Sanger. Sanger founded the American Birth Control League, which later became Planned Parenthood, and used it to progress her well-documented eugenics beliefs, and did it with funding by the Rockefeller family. The British Eugenics Society and the American Birth Control League were closely connected and mutually appreciative. Planned Parenthood still receives huge government funding to this day, including from the United Nations Population Fund. The British Eugenics Society became the Galton Institute, named after Sir Francis Galton, who founded it. Huxley was knighted in 1958 having won the Darwin Medal by the Royal Society in 1956, so he was clearly already very well regarded by the Queen and the Royal Family. The Huxley family were a very wealthy and well-connected family. Julian was the grandson of Thomas Henry Huxley, who was known as Darwin's Bulldog for his public advocacy of Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. And his brother, Aldous Huxley, is famous for being the writer of A Brave New World, Peter Scott, the son of Antarctic explorer Robert Falcon Scott, who at the time of the creation of the WWF had his own natural history series on BBC television called Look, ended up becoming the organisation's first chairman. He was given several royal honours, including being knighted in 1973. He was also responsible for the Panda logo. Dr Luke Hoffman, a Swiss ornithologist and author, is also credited in various places, including on the WWF website itself as one of the co-founders and now has an institution named after himself which is itself funded by the WWF. Prince Bernard may be familiar to some people for being a co-founder of the Bilderberg Conference which started in 1954 which has also been attended by members of the Rockefeller family and the British Royal family. The Bilderberg Conference has happened annually since 1954 and serves to bring together about 120 to 150 leaders of politics, banking, royalty, military and business to discuss in secret global issues concerning them. One theme running through all the powerful people involved in the creation of the WWF is that they are internationalists and that they are all working towards the same internationalist or globalist goals. We can see how an international wildlife charity could be useful to globalists in a more subtle and different way than, for example, their militaries might be. Globalisation requires clandestine infiltration, soft power, if you like, not just brute military might, which they have plenty of as well and use when they see fit. 
Prince Bernard was the head of the Dutch military in 1976 when it was revealed that he had accepted a $1.1 million bribe from Lockheed Corporation to influence the Dutch government's purchase of fighter aircraft. This became public and ended up costing him his official charity positions, including the presidency of the WWF, and of course he was forced to step down as the head of the Dutch military. He avoided his rightful place in prison, as most royals do, despite there being no doubt at all concerning the facts of the case. After he was relieved of his many responsibilities, he had more time for his leisure activities, which included fast cars, horse riding and big game hunting safaris. In 1973, the WWF hired their first scientist, Dr. Thomas Lovejoy, as project administrator. He immediately gave $38,000 to the Smithsonian Institution, where he still worked, to study the tiger population in Nepal. They also set about buying huge chunks of land in Kenya, Congo and Costa Rica, supposedly for the purpose of conservation. But would it be more accurate to call it for the purposes of collectivism? Thomas Lovejoy had graduated from Yale in 1964, soon after which he became a Carnegie Teaching Fellow. This fellowship was set up by one of the richest men in America, Andrew Carnegie, and in very much the same way that Cecil Rhodes and the Rockefeller family did, he created scholarships, fellowships, foundations, universities, and a wide range of different organisations, all designed to work together to further his own business and political ambitions, working with many other elitists to the same objectives. The Carnegie Endowment for International Peace is one of the foundations which has been investigated and exposed, for instance, getting the United States into the First World War through their influence over the State Department, as Norman Dodd discovered while working for the Reese Committee. Dr. Johnson, who was then president of the Carnegie Endowment, telephoned me and said, did I ever come up to New York? And I said, yes, I did, more or less each weekend. And he said, well, when you're next here, will you drop in and see us? Which I did. And Dr. Johnson said, after, again, amenities, Mr. Dodd, we have your letter. We can answer all those questions, but it'd be a great deal of trouble. And we have a counter-suggestion. Is that if you can spare a member of your staff for two weeks and send that member up to New York, we will give to that member a room in the library and the minute books of this foundation since its inception. And we think that whatever you want to find out or the Congress wants to find out will be obvious from those minutes. Well, my first reaction was they lost their mind. I had a pretty good idea of what those minutes would contain, but I realized that Dr. Johnson had only been in office two years, and uh, the other, the, the vice presidents were relatively young men, and counsel seemed to be also a young man, and I guessed that probably they'd never read the minutes themselves. And so I said I had somebody, I would accept their offer, and I uh, went back to Washington, and I selected the member of my staff, who was on my staff, having been a, a practicing attorney in Washington, but she was on my staff to pre see to it that I didn't break any congressional procedures or rules. In addition to which, she was unsympathetic to the purpose of the investigation. She was um, level-headed and a very reasonably brilliant, capable lady. And her attitude of, toward the investigation was, what could possibly be wrong with foundations? They do so much good. Well, in the face of that sincere conviction of Catherine's, I went out of my way not to prejudice her in any way. And off she went to New York. She came back at the end of two weeks with the following in the way of on, on dictaphone belts. We are now at the year 1908, which was the year that the Carnegie began operations. And in that year, the trustees, meeting for the first time, raise a specific question, which they discuss throughout the balance of the year 
in a very learned fashion. And the question is, is there any means known more effective than war, assuming you wish to alter the life of an entire people? And they conclude that no, no, no more effective means than war to that end is known to humanity. So then in 1909 they raised the second question and discuss it, namely, how do we involve the United States in a war? Then finally they answer that question as follows, we must control the State Department. And, the, uh, and then that very naturally raises the question of how do we do that? And um, they answer it by saying, we must take over and control the diplomatic machinery of this country. And finally they resolve to aim at that as an objective. Then time passes and we are eventually in a war, which would have been World War I. And at that time, they record on their minutes a shocking report in which they dispatched to President Wilson a telegram cautioning him to see that the war does not end too quickly. And finally, of course, we are, <clears throat> the war is over. At that time, their interest shifts over to preventing what they call a reversion of life in the United States to what it was prior to 1914. At that point, they come to the conclusion that to prevent a reversion, we must control education in the United States. Yeah, I might tell you this experience as far as its impact on Catherine Casey is concerned was she never was able to return to her law practice if it hadn't been for Carol Reese's ability to tuck her away on a job with the Federal Trade Commission. I don't know what would have happened to Catherine, but ultimately she lost her mind as a result of it. In 1984, Dr. Thomas Lovejoy also presented the WWF's Debt for Nature Swaps scheme in which indebted nations could just hand over their land for conservation as part payment for their debt to organizations run by royals and oil billionaires. Madagascar, Bolivia, Costa Rica, Ecuador, Gabon, the Philippines and Zambia are among the countries which have traded some of their debt for land. He climbed the ranks of the WWF, becoming their executive vice president in 1985 while working under President Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. He later got roles with the World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank. Lovejoy, originally selected by Godfrey A. Rockefeller for the WWF job, also went on to hold scientific advisory roles for the Reagan, George H.W. Bush and Bill Clinton administrations. Lovejoy has gone on to hold a huge number of positions in all sorts of organizations, including for the World Bank, the New York Botanical Gardens, Academy of Natural Sciences, Resources for the Future, World Resource Institute, Environmental Defense Fund, Center for Plant Conservation, Rainforest Alliance, American Institute of Biological Sciences, Wildlife Preservation Trust International, Earth Communications Office, Biosphere 2 Scientific Advisory Committee, U.S. Man and Biosphere Program, George Mason University, Woods Hole Research Center, Scientific Technical Advisory Panel for the Global Environment Facility, Institute for Ecosystem Studies, American Museum of Natural History, Conservation Trust Advisory Board for the National Geographic Society, White House Science Council, Committee on Environment and Natural Resources under the Executive Office of the President's National Science and Technology Council, United Nations Environment Program, Inter-American Development Bank, American Conservation Association, Heinz Center for Science, 
Economics and the Environment, American Academy of Art and Sciences, the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences, the American Ornithologists Union, the American Philosophical Society, the Linnean Society of London, and Population Action International. And in 2016, he was selected as a U.S. science envoy by the U.S. State Department under Obama's administration. This list is not even exhaustive. One of those which is worth a special mention is the United Nations Foundation, which was set up in 1998 with a $1 billion donation from Ted Turner, the media mogul billionaire who created CNN, and uses the money to engage in all sorts of campaigns, including climate change and vaccination campaigns. Lovejoy's positions just shows you how many doors become open to you if you work loyally for the right people and don't stray from the script. Obviously, considering that the globalist major scientific vehicle is now global warming, or should I say climate change, Thomas Lovejoy's efforts for the WWF and for most of the other organisations that he has been involved in have been directly in the furthering of that agenda in recent years. Human population control is another running theme among people involved in the WWF. It was something that Huxley was actively interested in and something that Prince Philip has commented about numerous times. Even biologist Thomas Lovejoy holds a place on the board of Population Action International. Let's have a look at what other kinds of people are put in charge at the WWF. In recent years, the WWF has been very closely linked with Coca-Cola Corporation, for example. The current chairman of the WWF is Neville Isdell, who is the former chairman and CEO of the Coca-Cola company where he worked for 43 years, starting in Zambia in 1966, later in the Philippines, where he was no doubt improving the lives of the locals there. The WWF started a formal partnership with Coca-Cola in 2007, supposedly to help conserve the world's fresh water resources. They say, our global partnership is focused on helping to ensure healthy, resilient freshwater basins in the Mesoamerican reef catchments in Mexico, Belize, Guatemala and Honduras and the Yangtze River Basin in China. WWF and the Coca-Cola Company collaborate locally in dozens of countries to create a more water secure future. Rather than helping the locals access clean water, Coca-Cola are repeatedly accused of dominating the water supply. In some developing countries it's easier to find Coca-Cola than it is to find clean water to drink. The WWF are trying to do the same with land as Coca-Cola are doing with water by collaborating with corrupt governments and multinational corporations to own the areas of natural beauty and wildlife and to be able to control the locals' access to them. Neville Isdell has also been the recipient of the Clinton Global Citizen Award. The current CEO and president of the WWF US is a guy called Carter Roberts. He joined the World Wildlife Fund having led international conservation and science programs for 15 years at the Nature Conservancy, another charity that warrants investigation currently being run by an ex-managing director of Goldman Sachs. Roberts serves on the board of the Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy at Duke University and the Grantham Institute for Climate Change at Imperial College and the London School of Economics. He is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, a globalist organisation with funding from the Rockefeller Foundation and the Ford Foundation designed to steer government policy. He is also a member of the International Finance Corporation's Advisory Panel on Sustainability and Business. He also serves on the advisory board of the Sustainable Energy for All initiative, chaired by the Secretary General of the UN and President Obama's Advisory Council on Wildlife Trafficking. The current president of the WWF International is a woman called Yolanda Kakabadze, who also fits the criteria of being a trustee of the Ford Foundation and an Earth Charter International Commission member, having previously been Minister of the Environment in the Ecuadorian government. Again, the links with private foundations set up by globalist billionaires and other globalising organisations is present. Other people among the WWF leaders include Hollywood film actor and United Nations ambassador Leonardo DiCaprio, who somehow keeps getting major roles in Hollywood despite his climate change activism, and Christopher Dodd, a US senator for 30 years who was, among many other things, involved in the creation of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, the disastrous bill known more commonly as Obamacare. He's also the current chairman and CEO of the Motion Picture Association of America.
There are many other people who have worked for and with the WWF over the last 55 plus years since its creation and I obviously can't include all of them here but I think the most important and influential people have been mentioned enough to get some kind of picture of what the motivations of the people in charge might be. The common themes are globalization, eugenics, human population control and more recently climate change. You have to look further down the organization for people who care about animals. Have the eugenics roots of the WWF really changed? Have the attitudes of royal families and ultra-rich towards poor people really changed? Or is there enough room to consider that their agendas have simply gone underground and been replaced on the surface with organisations that are much more suitable for public consumption? The WWF, for instance, will be received differently to the British Eugenics Society nowadays, even if they are working to similar objectives. I'm not categorically stating that the WWF have never done anything good, nor am I stating that everyone who has worked for the WWF is a eugenicist, elitist scumbag. Far from it, I know that lots of good people continue to work for the WWF, and this information is more for them than for anyone else. However, looking at people at the very top of the organisation, and at the people who have been appointed to important positions within the organisation, it's clear to me, and hopefully to you too, that people who believe in the never-ending project of globalisation, of centralisation of power, of increasing government and corporate control, of hierarchy and elitism, are the people who are continuously employed in the top positions. 19% of the income of the international WWF came through public sector, which means that governments are giving tens of millions of pounds of the people's money to the WWF. The government wouldn't continue to give money to the WWF if they were engaged in activities that damage them. People who engage in campaigns against the government find themselves with bigger problems than working out what to do with millions of pounds of stolen taxpayer money. It's one big club and it's paid for by those not invited to join. It's sad to see the generosity of people be exploited for the benefit of the very few and for their money to be used for activities which their donors wouldn't approve of. So if you want to donate money to a charity, please do some basic research on who's running the charity and what their objectives might be. The money which charities rake in from public donations causes an incredible amount of damage worldwide, to humans and animals alike, and it's all because people have generally taken no responsibility for how their donations are being spent. If your motivation for giving money to a charity is not to do some tangible good in the world, but rather to ease your own guilt for a misspent life, or to create an opportunity to show your friends how generous you are, then we're all better off you just keep your money in your pocket. All of the information I've found regarding the WWF has come from the people themselves and publicly accessible and verifiable information. I hope you have found this mini-documentary helpful, and I hope it encourages you to do some research for yourself. Thanks for watching.